So welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Brown with the Arizona Daily Star, and I am joined by the one and only Sarah Gasson, um, the opinion editor. Welcome. And we are excited today to have another new great guest with us, Mike Conway with the Arizona Geological Survey. So we're going to be hopefully grilling him with questions all about Arizona, different uh, things happening in our landscape and, and whatnot. So without further ado, let's just get right into it. If you want to do like a little bit further of an introduction of yourself, Mr. Conway, and just kind of explain to us a little more thoroughly what you do, what a day in the life of your job is. Um, and real quickly before that, please feel free to take advantage of asking questions in our chat. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be keeping an eye out and I'll kind of chime in as Mike is talking and ask those questions, but also feel free to raise your virtual hand. Um, it's always great to have you guys, you know, interact and hear your voices. So feel free to, to ask those questions. So go mm -hmm. ahead and take it away, Mike. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me fine. We can. Yes, very good. Uh, my name is Mike Conway. I'm a research scientist at the Arizona Geological Survey at the University of Arizona. And I've been there since 2007. Prior to that, I was a professor at Arizona Western College and then a research scientist at the Southwest Research in Institute in San Antonio, Texas. My background is in uh, volcanology and, and, and uh, the geologic hazards associated with uh, basaltic volcanic fields. So I've got something to say about that today, and you might not be accept, you might not be anticipating volcanism as a as a hazard here in Arizona, but there is a hazard, although it is unlikely to occur in our lifetimes. Um, since the 1980s, the Geological Survey has done a lot more work in the area of geological hazards. We really busted out then and began looking at geological hazards what with the population growth in the state and people encroaching in areas where there are more hazards, we began to move into that area. So we do a lot of monitoring and mapping and we make all of that information available to the public and to Arizona decision makers at no cost through a variety of our, through our websites. So let me kick off and, well, let me just mention right now, oh no, I think I'll just kick off and talk about earthquakes for just a moment because the my shake out is coming up. I'm gonna take control of the screen now. All right. Okay, ideally you all see this uh, PowerPoint slide over here. We are seeing it. Earthquakes, okay, great. Well, every year for the past decade, the Arizona Geological Survey has worked with the Department of Emergency Management and Military Affairs to showcase and promote earthquake mitigation practices. And this year on October 21st, we are hosting the Great Arizona Shakeout. It's a pretty simple exercise, drop, cover, and hold on, that try, we try and teach people what to do in the event of ground shaking from an earthquake. Uh, if, if, if you, and if you've ever been in an earthquake, and I've been in a handful of not large earthquakes, but moderate earthquakes, the tendency is to get up and run. You may run out the building, you may run into a, a hallway, whatever, but you tend to get up and run. That's not the best thing you can do. The drop cover and hold on is the safest approach if you're inside, because the likelihood of getting hurt is from things falling off the walls or falling off the ceiling. So if you can get underneath something and stay there until the ground shaking has ended, you're in better shape. So that's a, this first slide says Arizona has earthquakes, we do. About 100 a year that we originate within the state, but we also, of course, can be impacted by earthquakes in Sonora, Mexico, uh, Southern California, and Eastern California, Utah, Nevada, uh, and, and New Mexico. So we do feel earthquakes every single year, and some of those earthquakes could potentially be uh, damaging events. I'm going to go on to my next slide. Oh, I, before I do that, I'll point out, if you can see the cursor, the watch for rock signs, that's, the, that's a scarp, a fresh, relatively fresh fault scarp near Flagstaff, Arizona, along the Lake Mary Fault. It's about a 40-kilometer fault 
that terminates at the southern end, uh, at the south end of Flagstaff itself. And so it's an active fault. It potentially will rupture again, and they certainly will feel it in Flagstaff. And if you know Flagstaff at all, you recognize their historic, their downtown consists of a historic area with a lot of unreinforced masonry buildings. Those sorts of buildings don't stand up very well to ground shaking. So a magnitude six to magnitude seven event, which could occur on Lake Mary Fault, would probably do a lot of damage there and potentially cause some casualties and even some deaths. So is that a, I mean, a potential, like they kind of foresee that happening there in Flagstaff? Uh, I don't know if they do, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the, the problem is always is that the geologists do uh, and we communicate that, but do people, you know, they, do they internalize that and do they act on it? Uh, not so much. During the shakeout, uh, Northern Arizona University usually participates with their 25,000 students. We've had less success with the K through 12 schools in the Flagstaff area, uh, which always surprises me because we try and make a strong case. You are in a position where back in the early part of the 20th century, 1906 to 1912, there were three magnitude 6.0 earthquakes in that area. That same event should happen to get today with those older unreinforced buildings with the mortar entirely dried out, but likely to cause some real issues. So uh, before, I don't know if you're moving on, but we had a question in the chat. Uh, what is a fault? Can oh, you good. explain that? Yeah, I sure can. Let me, I'm gonna look at my slides real quickly. I can see them here. Well, and um, if you have, if that's coming down the road, that's fine if, we, if we'll get to it. That's no, fine no that's okay. This is, this is exactly the way I, I hope this will work is that I'll just address something and then somebody will come up with a question and we'll go, we'll delve, dive into it deeper. Um, a fault is a, a plane of weakness in the earth's crust along which the, the rocks on either side are prone to movement, okay? So, and of course the, the, the classic uh, here in the Western United States would be the, uh, I'm forgetting, not the San Jacinto. Uh, uh, San Andreas. San Andreas. San, thank you so much. The San Andreas Fault, where you've got the North American plate slipping past the Pacific plate. What happens is, of course, they don't slip flawlessly. The rocks get bound up, and they get bound up to the point where the strain is such that they just can't take any more strain, and then the rocks rupture, and you have an earthquake. And so uh, that is just one example of a fault. We have dozens and dozens of active faults in Arizona. And in California, they have hundreds and hundreds of active faults. So the Western United States is riddled with fault systems. Uh, we're fortunate in the sense that here in Arizona, our major faults and our longer faults tend to be active very highly infrequently. That is every 30 or 40 or 50,000 years they'll rupture, unlike the San Andreas where you can see rupture in a handful of decades. So we don't see those big earthquakes often, but they, the faults here in Arizona are capable, some of them are capable of producing a magnitude six to magnitude seven uh, earthquake. Wow. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but I'm, it's just another, whoops, get ready. This is uh, some of the paraphernalia that we use to promote ShakeOut. We aim this for the K-12 audience for the most part. So it's hosted at 1021 AM on the October the 21st, which is a Thursday. We're trying to get the schools to buy in. We figure if we can teach children what to do in the event of ground shaking and wherever they go, wherever they live, and some of them will live in areas where earthquakes happen, they'll know what to do. So this event, this shakeout is happening virtually? It, it no, we, we actually, well, we hope that you'll practice it in your homes and in your schools. Most of the materials and promotional materials are online and developed by the Southern California Earthquake Center. That's where these, these objects come from. Okay. And they also have some simulations, some audio and some web material or some video materials that if you wanna make it a little more realistic, you show those at the same time you're practicing ShakeOut. Okay. And simple, you know, two minute exercise or less. Um, I'm pointing to it with my hand, but you can't see it. Can you, can you all see the, can you see the cursor okay? Yes, yeah. This is it. In the event of ground checking, you're inside, drop to the ground, 
cover your head and hold on, get underneath something and hold on. And if you can't get underneath something, drop to the ground, cover your head. If you can't drop down quickly, cover your head, right? And be prepared for things to come flying off the walls. Uh, flat screen TVs are a real hazard uh, because they're so unstable, they tend to fall over and uh, they can really hurt people. Okay, so one more slide and then I, I've got other slides, but I'm gonna let people drive this. Here at the survey, we have a viewer called the Natural Hazards in Arizona. It's an active, it's an act, interactive viewer that also includes the databases. And we have a series of themes that are shown there. And this, uh, this image on the right, or I'm sorry, this image that you see on your screen, we have uh, themes for earthquake faults, for earth fissures, for earthquake epicenters, for landslides, um, other hazards that we see, other, well, other themes that are there are fire and flood, although we populate other data, other data sets from other groups for those particular themes. And we have uh, other, other hazards in the state, just to name a couple, our problem soils, radon and volcanoes. So, so like I see on the earthquake faults, in Tucson, there's like green and then like that magenta color. So what what yep. do those mean? Is one like more serious than another or more prone or? That's an age break. It's a frequency break. So the purple is the younger, more active one. But you ask a good question. So I'm going to slide down to that slide. Yep. And it was... That's not the very next slide. I'm sorry. That's okay. I knew that I was going to do this out of order. And Santa Rita fault is number five. Oh, there it is. That's a satellite image. So here's Tucson. You asked a nice question, Sarah. Here's Tucson up here. This is the Santa Rita fault on the west side, the west off the west flank of the Santa Rita Mountains. It's a pretty young, uh, reasonably active fault, probably ruptured in the last 20,000 or 30,000 years certainly capable of a magnitude six to a magnitude seven earthquake. As you can see, the, the green traces are the trace of the Santa Rita Fault. It's, we're not, it's not far from Tucson. It's not far from Green Valley. Um, Tucson has a historic section, of course, a lot of older buildings, a lot of unreinforced masonry buildings. If the Santa Rita Fault were to rip along most of its length, would probably generate a magnitude six or magnitude 6.5. That would be felt in a very big way in Tucson, would certainly do some damage to some homes, could cause some injuries and certainly, and could also cause some deaths as well. And that's one of the reasons we promote shakeout, because if you're inside and you feel that, your best, the best practice is simply to get down underneath something and cover up. So looking at the um, Santa Rita Mountains, the natural, uh -huh. is, is Rosemont Mine? Um, where is that in relation, if you know? Uh, and, off the top of my head, I'd put it where you see the cursor in here, in this okay. area right here, okay? Um, so it is not particularly threatened by an earthquake, but of course, obviously there, there could be an impact there as well. Because that, uh, you know, as the earthquake, as the fault ruptures, seismic energy radi out, radiates out in 360 degrees and is gonna be felt around the area considerably. Thank you. But does the potential of uh, like the mine, um, like the new Rosemont mine, um, them mining there and causing all that movement, does that, can that affect and make? No, probably not. Okay. Probably not. Um, the one thing you wouldn't want to do along young faults or active faults is you don't want to lubricate them by pumping water down alongside of them, because that certainly can cause them to reactivate. But the mining itself, the, uh, the activity from the mining, the energy released in the ground from the mining is most unlikely to cause any problems with the Santa Rita fault system. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> it, is. it is, but I will say there's a, a new study out and Phil Pertry, who is our director, is one of the co-authors, which shows that the strain, the rate of strain in, the, uh, in Southern Arizona and across what's referred to as the Basin Range Province is greater than we thought it was which means that there's a lot more energy that's developing there that could be released at some point along these fault systems when they rupture. 
So uh, we do have a question. Someone was aware about the uh, volcano. Thomas okay. was asking, what do you know about the Spanish La Paloma volcano? When the lava hits water, what happens? Is it dangerous? It sure is. A couple of years ago, more than a couple of years, probably a decade or so ago, uh, during the, uh, the, eruption, the active eruptions at Kilauea on Hawaii, somebody got a little too close, somebody in the scuba diving got too close and was parboiled essentially. You know, basically the water heated up very suddenly and they were way too close and they simply become parboiled. So yeah, there's a hazard with that. When that lava reaches the ocean and the temperature of the lava is about 1100 degrees Celsius, it goes into that water at ambient temperature, whatever that might be there. Uh, it, it tends to, ex the gases expand and it tends to expend a lot of energy and so it, it sort of blasts open when that happens. So it can be dangerous. Uh, at the moment, it's building new landforms out there in La Palma. Oh, wow. But since I had a question about volcanoes, I'm not gonna pass it. I'm not gonna let my slide go unused. I'm gonna go down to it. Okay. You see the on the, the, the map on the left-hand slide of this PowerPoint slide shows a number of colored areas. Those are young volcanic fields. Three of those fields should be considered active today. Not that there's an active eruption going on because these, are, th these, these type of fields have very low volume of eruptives and they sometimes it'll be a thousand or 2000 or 3000 years between eruptions. But the UN Karat, UN Karat, a uh, volcanic field up here in northern Arizona, which is on the north rim of Grand Canyon, the San Francisco volcanic field outside of Flagstaff, and the Pinacate volcanic field on the Mexico-US border are, should all be considered active volcanic fields. These other fields, the Sentinel, the Springerville over here, the San Bernardino, it's been hundreds of thousands of years since there, hundreds of thousands or a million years since there's been an eruption there, and we don't think there will be any future eruptions. We don't see that happening, but we do think there will be future eruptions in the UN Caret, San Francisco or Spinacate. And of course, the youngest volcano in Arizona is the Sunset Crater at San, in the San Francisco uh, volcanic field, which is just under a thousand years old. So what are, what are these cities, you know, like Flagstaff, that volcano looks like it's right kind of in the heart of Flagstaff. So that, what, that is what, a, very good. No, that's a great question. That's the volcanic field. It's the extent, oh, okay. the aerial extent of the field that encompasses 600 cinder cones and 10 or 12 uh, larger silicic volcanoes, including San Francisco Peak. So that's the full extent of the field, just like this is the full extent of the field up here for the UN Caret. Yeah. So do, do those cities take any measures in being aware oh, of that? Of I, I think the folks in Flagstaff are reasonably aware of it. It's, it's a tourist attraction for them, for goodness sakes. They get a lot of people that come out to see, to, to ski in the, the peaks or to do, or to hike in the peaks or to look at Sunset Crater. So a lot of people really visit these areas because of the volcanism, because those volcanoes are there and makes the landscape so majestic and so beautiful. I threw up a couple images over here on the right, that sunset crater. Uh, at the base from side to side, it's probably about a mile, maybe uh, maybe three quarters of a mile in length. And this is Vulcan's throne in the Yukon Karet volcanic field. And as you can see, it's sitting on the edge of, of the north rim of Grand Canyon. And uh, it, the Yuen Karet's an interesting field. It's a young field. It's got a lot of cinder cones and lava flows. And some of those flows on at least on more than a dozen occasion have cascaded down into Grand Canyon and dammed up the Colorado River. Built dams as, as, as large as 200 meters, about 600 feet high, which take considerable amount of time to erode and then and break through. Um, so it has the potential to impact. If there were an eruption today, and lavas cascaded down into the Grand Canyon, it would have an impact uh, in California and Arizona, of course, because about 35 or 40 million people rely on the waters from the Colorado River. 
Yeah, that's that's one subject I haven't come up in the water issues that we've all been discussing is the potential of that blockage. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what you'd call a low probability, high consequence event. So the yeah. likelihood is very low, but the consequence, should it happen, would be very great. Now, I don't know much about volcanoes, but like you said that the sunset crater is about a mile. I mean, is that big? Is that... No. That, okay. That's typical for cinder cones. There are 600 cones like Sunset Crater in the San Francisco volcanic field. Uh, I think there are about 300, 250 in the Pinacate field and uh, several hundred, I think, in UN Correct. They're very, they're the most common type of volcano that form on terrestrial, on the terrestrial surface, but they're small, they're generally well-behaved volcanoes and they have a very short time uh, uh, lifespan, maybe a year or two years or three years. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the San Francisco peaks, and I didn't include a picture of that here, which is that very large volcano and large mountain that you see in the Flagstaff area, probably had a lifespan of over a million years. So it would continue, you know, it would go in and out of, in and out of eruptive cycle, um, and sometimes tens of thousands of years, perhaps, between eruptive cycles, but it was active throughout that time. Sunset Crater was probably active for a year, maybe two years, and then it shuts down entirely and never re never erupts again. Mm -hmm. In fact, what we anticipate is because of, we know a lot about, oops, I'm pointing to the slide like you can see my finger. Now I have the cursor on the west side of the San Francisco field. Mm -hmm. West, the locus of volcanism here has been going from the west side where it started to the east side. The field's been active for over 6 million years. And the last eruption over here on the east side was Sunset Crater. So we anticipate it's not done yet. It will continue. There will be new cinder cones erupting, probably east, if, if it continues to follow that path, east of Sunset Crater. Wow. Well, so we have a question in the <laughs> chat about sinkholes. Are sinkholes a growing problem? I know I lived down in Benson, St. David area for a time, and there have been some crazy sinkholes <laughs> down in that area. So what can you tell us about them? Yeah, that's a good question. I wish I had I wish I had put a, uh, I, I don't think I have anything here to show the karst, which is uh, the type of hazard we'd be talking about is karst, but sinkholes form, geologic sinkholes, form in, in karst environments, that is in things like limestone and gypsum and salt beds, things of that sort. I think that the sinkholes, when you talk about sinkholes down by Benson, you're probably referring to collapsing soils or something of that sort. Oh, we, maybe. We do have sinkholes in Southern Arizona. We have caves in Southern Arizona, which are formed by the same process of dissolution as groundwaters, acidic groundwaters move through limestone they'll eat away and form the caves. But most of the really large karst features we see expressed at the surface are up in Northern Arizona. Okay. And there's some really interesting uh, ground fractures up there that, excuse me, hundreds of feet deep and 15 or 20 feet wide at the surface and go for a mile or two. Most of those are on Navajo tribal lands. So they get very few visitors. Uh, there's not a lot of hazard to the local population. People know where they're at, but they are certainly, uh, they lose cattle and they lose sheep in there once in a while. I would imagine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But karst is certainly a concern, not only here, but across the United States, about 20% of the state, the 20% of the ground surface in the United States is capable of forming karst type of features. And so we do see sinkholes up in the uh, northern Arizona, there's a place just south of just south east of uh, Holbrook called the Macaulay Cab and uh, Macaulay Caves or Macaulay Sinks. That's it, the Macaulay Sinks, which are a series of sinkholes that have developed up there. They're not very large, but it, interestingly, there is still some subsidence going on. That is, they're still sinking a little bit, not catastrophically, but slowly the basin, the floor of these. Some of these sinks continue to subside. We know that because the Arizona Department of Water Resources has been using their interferometry uh, radar to look at that, or radar to look at that sort of thing. 
So we know that they're still subsiding. They don't really generate much of a hazard. Um, not like we see in Florida when all of a sudden a new sinkhole opens up underneath the house and somebody's home gets crushed and, and the person's in there. Not like that, but still it's an issue. Definitely. So we have another question here uh, from Kent. What is the difference between a fault and a fissure? A fault, there's a difference. In the case of a fault, I'm showing my hands. Can you see that? We can see you, yeah. In the case of a fault, right, you have a fault plane and there's blocks of rock on either side. There's some displacement of the fault. There's some, excuse me, some displacement of the ground, the rock. So you get this sort of thing where all of a sudden the fault reactivates, one block goes up and the other block slides down. In the event of a fissure, um, especially in something like an earth fissure, what you're really looking at are lateral forces that are pulling it apart a little bit and causing that. But there's no movement up and down of the, or very minimal movement up and down of those blocks. And it doesn't, by the way, the earth fissures open up, they don't generate uh, seismic energy sufficient to measure, so they don't produce earthquakes. Let me show you a picture of some earth fissures since we're on fissures. There we go. Uh, we only see earth fissures forming in five, four counties, five counties, if you count Pima, we've got a couple of old ones. But Cochise, La Paz, Maricopa, and Pinal counties all have earth fissures. Unfortunately, the growth area is Cochise County, where there's a lot of farming going on, a lot of uh, cattle raising going on. So they're drawing out groundwaters at a very rapid pace. That caused the basin floor to subside. And when it subsides, you get lateral stresses from the outside in, causing some fissures to develop. Um, in the state of Arizona right now, we have a little over 200 mapped miles of fissures and another 150 or so of unconfirmed fissures. That is, they're in areas where they may exist, but because there's something blocking our, our view of them, we can't tell if they're there or not i.e. they're in farmlands and they're being plowed over all the time, or they're running through housing additions and we only hear about cracking foundations. So we do have an earth fissure issue. Those four counties is where we have a lot of agriculture. It's all associated with uh, harvesting groundwater for the purposes of agriculture. Turns out that growing crops in the Sonoran Desert is a water intensive business. <laughs> well, we, uh, solve one problem, create another. Exactly, exactly. By the way, this, these fissures, um, this is reasonable. They're usually, they're five or 10 feet across, 15 or 20 feet deep, sometimes 30 or 40 feet deep on rare occasions. And they can extend for miles. We, Joe Cook, who's in this, this fellow right here, heads up our earth fissure program, discovered a fissure that formed in Southern Pinal County, I think it was in 2017. It's almost two miles long. In fact, that particular fissure is where he's standing right now. So fissures are not going away. They're continuing to develop. And as we draw, continue to draw groundwater out of the basins, we'll probably see fissures continue to form. So do these just kind of pop up? I mean, do they like start small and they get bigger or is it just like you kind of go out there one day and it's like, wow, there's this huge. <laughs> no, absolutely. You're right. Uh, if you go out when it's in its incipient phase, you'll see a little, a crack that's maybe an inch wide and you'll follow it for tens of feet. And it's only an inch wide. And you think, well, is this a developing fissure or is this just a, you know, soil desiccation, a crack in the soil? I'll tell you what, we actually have a fissure, an earth fissure season here and it's associated with the monsoons. When the monsoons come and we get those torrential rains and that runoff here in the desert area, that, that water runs off into the fissures and causes the fissures to open up and to broaden. And that's when we see fissures really developing. Uh, they're there in the subsurface, but we generally don't see them. When, the, uh, when we get the, uh, the monsoon rains, that's when they'll begin to open up. Uh, we've had a number of issues. If you've been following the stories in Cochise County, Tony Davis has been writing about it. Uh, I think there have been two or three roads that have been closed, mm -hmm. at least in the case of two of them, in, due to earth fissures that opened up and cut across the roads. So uh, they, they cause some damage. They're, they're hard to mitigate. Uh, you think, well, I'll just fill it with stuff. 
well, that doesn't work very well because the water will still rush in and, and go down into the fissure and cause that the fissure bottom to erode and material will drop further down. By the way, the, the real hazard here, obviously you could ride a, a motorbike or something like that off into one of these things, but I think the real hazard here goes overlooked. And that is, we believe that based on our models that these earth fissures extend all the way down to the groundwater table, two or 300 feet below the surface. Now imagine that you've got some sort of toxic spill that runs into those fissures. That's got a direct feed into your groundwater, your aquifer. And muddying, dirtying up an aquifer probably isn't very difficult, but cleaning them really is and costs a lot of money and a lot of time and energy. So they represent a hazard to our groundwater resources in the state. We need to be very careful that we make sure that nobody starts building gas stations over the top of these things, because that would be uh, catastrophic to have an aquifer contaminated by those materials. Yeah, that sounds like it would be a real mess. <laughs> so let's see, Thomas asked a question uh, in the chat, are geysers related to volcanoes? Uh, you can find geys gey excuse me, geysers at volcanic systems, but you don't need a volcanic system to produce a geyser. Those big geysers at Yellowstone are heated by, uh, are heated by heat coming off of a, a, a lower magma, a magma chamber in the, in the Earth's crust. So they're associated with, well, they're associated with a, uh, an igneous intrusion. They're associated with igneous heat, but they're not driven by the volcanic eruptions themselves. They're driven by the circulation of this hot waters uh, associated with heat coming off of a magma chamber. And so we usually have an underground source of heat that drives geyser formation. I'm trying to get back here. Okay, so I could put that slide up again to sort of help you guys drive your uh, drive any conversations. By the way, this over here on the right, I didn't really show you earthquakes. I showed you faults, but when faults rupture, they cause earthquakes. In our catalog here at the Arizona Geological Survey, Jerry Young Ben Huron uh, manages that catalog and manages our broadband seismic network. We have over 3,000 uh, earthquakes that have that have occurred in in Arizona that are that are in that catalog. So we get lots of earthquakes, but we don't get a lot of big earthquakes, which is good. But those are the ones you have to be wary of. Yeah, I think it's just something we really don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis living here is having yeah. an earthquake. Um, you know, so I think those, your shake it out class, you know, just simple reminders. You said it was geared toward young kids, but as adults, we need that reminder living here, absolutely. you know, because it is a real danger. And You're absolutely right. And, and the one thing we always like to remind people, and they say, well, we don't have, we're over here in eastern Arizona. We don't have much of a hazard. Yeah, it can happen, but we don't see them very frequently. I said, well, what guarantee do you have that everybody's going to stay put? People are going to go to California. The last time I was in California a couple of years ago was for an earthquake symposium. And guess what? We all got to feel an earthquake. Well, that was a good demonstration. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a big earthquake, but I was up on the sixth story of this hotel in in. Um, Oh gosh, in southern in southern California, and sure enough, the building started shaking back and forth, and it was enough that, you know, I got out of bed and put my feet on the floor and wondered, well, what what can I crawl underneath to be safe here? So I got underneath the desk and waited it out. The shaking in that case lasted five, maybe six seconds, and that was it. It was just real quick. Wow. So let's see. We have another question from Sherry in the chat. Do geothermals indicate earthquake and or volcanic activity? Uh, geothermal certainly can be associated with volcanic activity, no question about it. Interestingly, I, I pointed out that, or I mentioned that the San Francisco volcanic field has been active for 6 million years with the latest eruption only a thousand years ago. There is no geothermal, there are no geothermal elements in the San Francisco volcanic field by and large. We don't see anything, and the, one of the reasons is is that the the slope of the groundwater in that in 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 the Flagstaff area is it is down to or excuse me is to the north to Grand Canyon, and so the the water is carrying off the heat 
that might we might anticipate seeing causing some geothermal features in the field. That heat is going off and going out into the Grand Canyon where you don't see the heat, but you can tell from the isotopes of the gas or of the water that, that it's carrying a magmatic signature, a signature associated with uh, volcanism. Hmm. She had a little bit more to her question. Uh, she also said, what about the enormously deep salt deposits? Could they cause easier movement on fault lines or ease of upward movement of volcanic activity? Not so much that. Um, salt's an interesting feature because sometimes it forms what are called diapers, these the diapers, I'm sorry, these plumes, because salt, typically the buried salt is less dense than the surrounding rock. And so it tends to, and it behaves like a plastic sometimes. So it tend to flow up and form these diapers. And those are uh, those diapers tend to be very good places to look for oil and gas, uh, oil and gas production in the Gulf of Mexico and other areas. We don't see that here. I'll tell you what the, what's very interesting right now about our salt deposits, and we have some tremendous salt deposits here in Arizona, is we're looking at uh, Brian Gotee and our staff and Lisa Thompson are looking at carbon sequestration. Right? We've all got the idea that climate change is a concern. What do you do with the carbon in the atmosphere? And so the federal government is providing money to the state's geological surveys to say, hey, is there any place that you could store carbon sequestration in a geologic repository, i.e. underground? Well, we don't have a lot of good places in Arizona for that, but we do have salt cat, we do have salts. And basically what you can do is push water into that salt and form, uh, form a cavity or a container that you can then put the carbon in and cap. Now that's really, we're in the early stages of looking at that, but we have the salt deposits here in Arizona to examine that. Maybe they could be a place where we can store excess carbon dioxide. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, let's see. Here right now, of course, we in places in, in Phoenix, we have um, LP gas being stored. In, in, in the salt deposits up there. Well, we appreciate you answering all of our questions. We're just going to keep them coming. Everybody has yeah, some sure. good questions. <laughs> um, so Thomas asks, besides copper and gold, what other minerals are common to Arizona? Uh, gold isn't that common. Although, you know, obviously we do have some gold prospects and we have some gold mines. Uh, I'm trying to think. Copper stone over in the Western Arizona and the gold gold road mine up in uh, north of King, I believe it's north of Kingman are mines that are, people are looking at now to re, I think the gold road is actually reopened. I think Copperstone reopened for a while and then closed down because there was insufficient uh, reserves to keep it open. We do have a lot of copper. Uh, we have the salt deposits, right? You have Morton Salt up in Phoenix, which is harvesting that salt. We have a, a number of industrial minerals, uh, rocks, slates, and things of that sort, which are being used around the state. Sandstones, every now and again, if you drive down I-10, I you'll see somebody with a big semi-tractor trailer out there trying to sell large pieces of sandstone that probably come out of Northern Arizona. So we have a number of other things. And at the copper mines, we also harvest gold. It's a, it's a byproduct, gold, molybdenum, um, one of the big deposits that's going to be opening probably in a couple of years is down in the Patagonia area, and that's a lead silver, uh, a lead and silver deposit that is uh, considered to be a world class deposit. Uh, the Patagonia area was a mining area uh, decades ago, and all the mines got played out. And there's been some recent exploration by a group of people to look at what resources may be there. And it turns out that lead silver, those lead silver deposits are really, really uh, rather large. So there's a group now, South 39, that's working on that and putting their permits in place to do some mining down there. Well, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that by probably Tony Davis in the paper. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. And I, I know there's a group in the Patagonia area that's been very uh, aggressive about getting information out. Obviously, they're not too terribly happy about it because they don't want to see the traffic and they don't want to see any of the other 
uh, byproducts of mining that accompany mining, but they are living in a, an old mining district where uh, there was a lot of mining at one point in time. So we touched on this a little bit. Um, Thomas asked, can we predict earthquakes and volcano eruptions? Yeah, that's a great question, Thomas. Um, we really can't. We really can't. It's, um, there's been some effort by the United States Geological Survey along the San Andreas Fault to uh, forecast rupture events, basically the fault rupturing and earthquakes forming. Uh, they've had limited, limited success, and they've spent a lot of time and energy studying that. Most of the faults, the faults that we have in Arizona, we haven't spent a fraction of that kind of time. So we have no predictive capabilities. And there are a number of faults that probably we, that are there in the subsurface that we don't even know about. And we'll only know about them when they rupture. So yeah, we are, we are unable at this point to predict or forecast uh, when uh, earth, faults are gonna rupture and earthquakes occur. Um, with, volcanic, with volcanic processes, we can do a little bit better, um, especially perhaps in the case of larger volcanic eruptions, because as magma moves up through the Earth's crust, it generates a lot of small, essentially, initially anyway, small seismicity, so that if you properly, uh, if you've got a number of seismometers around a particular locale, you'll actually sense the magma rising up to the Earth's crust. And as it gets near to the crust, it'll begin to exolve um, gases and begin to form small explosions within the crust, and those are detectable. So that's a possibility that we could perhaps detect a larger eruptive event, but a small eruptive event, not quite so likely. I was at a meeting in Flagstaff five or six years ago with groups of volcanologists and uh, and uh, hazard, uh, I'm sorry, emergency management folks. And the emergency management folks was, well, let's imagine for a moment, there's an, er there's a, an eruption here in San, in the San Francisco field. When are you going to know about it? And the answer on, at that point was, we probably, the network, seismic networks as such, we won't know about it until somebody probably reports something going on because we just don't have the network to narrow that down. So is there any sort of, and sorry if this is a naive question, any sort of detection equipment to where these, you know, volcanoes and known, you know, areas are kind of monitored to kind of give us yeah. a heads up if something big is coming? You bet, you bet. And uh, in, in active, in areas where we anticipate uh, larger eruptions like along the Cascades, right, Mount St. Helens area. The United States Geological Survey does a very good job of using a variety of techniques, including seismicity, uh, remote sensing of gases, so on, uh, deformation of the volcano itself. So they do a very good job of, of monitoring those. But most, of, most volcanoes aren't monitored like that. They really aren't. And there's, as I said, we have active volcanic fields in Arizona but we don't have active volcanoes and none of our volcanic systems are being monitored other than uh, by local seismometers. Um, and which probably would only detect some activity after really it, it probably began. Okay. You know, the, the USGS was, uh, and I'm going back to Mount St. Helens in 1980, the USGS was not surprised by the eruptive activity at Mount St. Helens. They were aware of it, they forecast it. What they weren't, what they didn't anticipate was the lateral blast component to it. Nobody had seen that, uh, except for the Russians at, at, at Bezimiani. So nobody had really seen that before. And so they, they were caught by surprise, but the actual eruptive events, um, they, didn't, they didn't nail it to a day or, or an hour, but they, they, they knew it was coming and they knew where it would be. Let's see, we're gonna keep them coming. How deep are aquifers? Uh, well, that's a, that's a really good question and I'm not a hydrogeologist. Oh, well, we should, we should ask this question a few weeks ago. We had a hydrologist on. Yeah, <laughs> I can't yeah, remember yeah. if we asked that did, question. Did you ask him about volcanoes? <laughs> that's fair. 
I don't remember if we talked about, but we, we usually ask all of our guests some questions that they don't know answers to. We That's just funny. like to do that. <laughs> Most aquifers are relatively shallow, you know, uh, 100 feet, 300 feet, 400 feet down before you tap into the groundwater. Uh, what can happen is, of course, as you're tapping into groundwater, like we're doing in Cochise County and in Pinnell, and you draw from deeper and deeper depths, what, what's going to happen is the waters will become more saline as you go deeper and deeper. So the quality of the groundwater uh, lessens considerably. And then it becomes a question for you if you're using it for irrigation purposes. Do you have the, re do you have the resources, the funds to clean the water before you put it on your before you put it on your fields. Now we're not in that position yet here in Arizona, but that's the end result because we know that recharge of our aquifers in areas where we're, we're harvesting a lot of water is falls far behind, or excuse me, discharge is much greater than recharge, right? So we're not putting, enough water's not getting back in there. And so the groundwater table will continue to fall. And as it continues to fall, the quality of the water will probably deteriorate. And that's um, one of the things we are actually right now looking to hire a subsurface geologist here at the Arizona Geological Survey to help us with just those kinds of questions. What do we know about the deeper aquifers? What do we know about the condition of the water? And what do we, and that individual will help us with carbon sequestration as well. So we're looking into those areas, but traditionally we haven't had much of a role. That was the Arizona Department of of uh, water resources. So if you're a subsurface geologist, apply at the U of A. <laughs> we, we put information out at our Facebook page and out at our Twitter and out on our website. And we, I, we sent out notes to the three, four universities in the area to let them know, to let them know their grad, let their graduate students know, their form, you know, the students who've completed their work that this job is opening up. So we anticipate we'll get somebody pretty soon. I'm sure you will. So we'll get back to more of the questions in the chat, but I know something I think we all kind of want to talk about is we've had some pretty devastating fires in the past few years. Yeah. And so talking yeah. about what dangers does this create and the landslides, and then if we combine that with our, you know, um, our monsoon season that we had this year, what are some potential dangers or things that we see already happening because of some of that? Yeah, that's a great question. And we have several people on our staff who are looking at that precise question. Ann Uberg, who's been at the survey longer than I have, and Becky Beers um, are working in areas like the museum fire up in Flagstaff, uh, looking at the, the fires here in the Santa, the, the recent fires in the Santa Catalinas, and other locales across the state and even into New Mexico, trying to figure out, well, how quickly do these systems, these ecosystems recover sufficiently so that you don't get a lot of material being swept down channel during the monsoon rains? Because that's, that's, the, real, uh, that's the real issue, of course, is what happens during the monsoon as, as these waters run over these scarred and, and damaged soils, which no longer have the holding power that they would have normally. And what we see are a lot of debris flows. And we saw that up in Flagstaff area. We've seen that in the Santa Catalinas. We've seen that in, uh, I think it's a, not the Chiricahuas, excuse me. Well, we have seen it in the Chiricahuas, but it was several years ago. Mm -hmm. On the mountain ranges here in, in uh, the Western United States and here in Arizona, that's what we anticipate is that with larger magnitude or larger wildfires that burn hotter and destroy soils, that what we're going to see is that during the following rains or snow melts, we're going to see more debris and more material coming down slope and doing a lot of damage. So we're looking at uh, we're looking at that. We've got some active research going on, and Becky and Ann have got papers to present at the Geological Society of America meeting coming up in uh, mid October. So it's not just. Um you know, what it burns on the surface, it's actually, it alters something that's in the soil itself that it creates the potential. So it they're damaged. researching that actually to see what. You bet, yeah. It damages those soils. How quickly those si soils repair themselves is, is an open question. And it's something that these guys are looking at along with trying to figure out, you know, how much water, how much rain does it take to form a debris flow 
in an area that's been burnt at this level. So there's a lot of questions that are being trying to be addressed. And of course, this is not limited to Arizona. The Southwestern United States is uh, where a lot of this is happening. So there are a lot of people with the United States Geological Survey and other state geological surveys who are looking at these same sorts of processes, trying to figure out, gee, and, and how do we develop a warning system so we can tell people you should anticipate this. Yeah, because I mean, this year with the, you know, more rain than we've had, and then all the fires, seeing footage like up in Flagstaff, you know, with just so much debris, and there was cars right. just floating, and, you know, it was just. It was, a, it was a real surprise. I think it was Miami. Uh, Miami or Globe saw some massive uh, flooding go through. So um, we, we're seeing a lot of that. There's a lot more of it. Uh, the federal government is aware of that. There are lots of research funds out there right now to try and help us identify those problem areas. What processes are going on there? What do we need? How do we mitigate that? Now, that's not the job of the survey to figure out how to mitigate it. Our job is to try and figure out, okay, how does this happen? What are the conditions? Do, how much warning time do we get? And how do we let people know that these hazards exist? Yeah, and, and, and what do you do? You know, I mean, how do you prepare for it? So once you find that out, there's just so many steps to take from there, but. You, you bet, but there, there is, you know, there are such things as early warning systems. So if we see a certain amount of rain falling up in the San Francisco peaks, in the area where the museum fire was, we may be able to say, hey, at this particular level, we reach this particular level, we know we're going to see debris flows. We know they're going to come down. And we can, based on uh, past events, maybe we can forecast where they're going to go and perhaps how far out they're going to go. So we are trying to do that. And you may remember, um, and this is not a post wildfire event, or at least probably not, um, the Santa Catalina Mountains in 2006 had a number of debris flows associated with a monsoon event. Five days of rain basically caused uh, hundreds of debris flows to form, not only in the Catalinas, but across Southern Arizona. So I have a couple questions from a couple different people in the chat. So uh, both about Yellowstone. Um, okay. <laughs> not sure if that at all is in your area. It's, you know, it's volcanism. Uh, <laughs> At least I hope it is. If it's about grizzly bears, I'm just way out of my depth. Okay, well, let's switch to grizzly bears then. <laughs> okay, so Judith asked, can you speak briefly about the Yellowstone area called Caldera? Caldera. Yeah. And then the other part about Yellowstone is, is there a cap building in Yellowstone Park that would result in a mega volcano? Is there a what now? I'm sorry, I didn't understand uh, It that. says, is there a cap? building in oh, Yellowstone Park that could result okay. in a mega volcano? Well, it, it's a good question and I'm not a Yellowstone expert. Uh, the USGS has a dedicated team of researchers uh, who st are stationed at Yellowstone and look at that and look at the volcanism there and the seismicity in great detail. Uh, there's no question that it has produced caldera forming events in the past. Uh, I think the last one was about 740,000 years ago, and the one before that was about 700,000 years before that. Um, so there, and there certainly is a heat source underneath Yellowstone. We know that there's a pool of magma of some size uh, there. I don't know the volumes. I don't know the details about that, but it's certainly the kind of area where we would anticipate future volcanic activity probably would not anticipate necessarily anticipate a super volcano formation, which is the caldera forming. Um, and and an, interesting, an interesting aside is that we have never seen, in modern day science, we have never seen uh, a caldera form. So the question would be, what are the harbors of this? What do they look like? Would we be able to tell the difference between uh, a volcanic dome forming, beginning to form, and a caldera formation? Would we know the difference between them? Or would we be just caught by surprise? I frankly think we probably would detect it in advance. And I think what the, the individual is getting at with the cap is probably talking about gases that are exhaling from a magma chamber and stabilizing at the top of that magma chamber. And imagine what happens with a Coke bottle 
and you shake it up and all the gases come to the top of the Coke bottle. And what happens when you take the lid off? It blows, right? So if, if those gases overpressure the rock on top, they could in essence blow the rock apart and start the formation of a, of a caldera or super volcano. Uh, I, would we would we recognize the, the that the gases were that the gas levels at the top of the chamber had reached that critical point? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows for sure. But we would anticipate seeing a lot of other kinds of activity, um, degassing, uh, an increase of sulfur dioxide, um, fumaroles becoming more active. A number of other things will be going on before that event. Um, let's see, we're winding down on time, but that brought on another question. What is a volcanic dome and how does it differ from a caldera? Uh, if, if this individual's ever been to Flagstaff Mount Eldon, Eldon Mountain actually is what its, its proper name, is a volcanic dome. Uh, volcanic domes tend to be um, events that are longer lived. And what happens is there's a very viscous and, and sort of a cool magma that just kind of begins to slowly eke out of the ground and form these dome-like structures. And they can be very explosive at times, but they're not as long lived and they're not as explosive as super calderas. Super calderas are at the top of the list of really hazardous and dangerous kinds of event, volcanic or geologic events for that matter. So other than being- You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't want to be in North America if Yellowstone goes. <laughs> really wouldn't. So other than keeping ourselves individually informed and aware of what's going on in our area, which it sounds like uh, you guys are a great resource to you know, get information, what can we as individuals do to, to make sure we're not contributing to any of the hazards or you know, things like that in Arizona? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, some of the hazards that people can contribute to in road building and things of this sort are landslides. Um, you'll notice we have a lot of mountains in Arizona, and if you're going to cut a road, you have to cut a road through the mountains or, you know, it's going to wind its way through those mountains. And, and it's not uncommon to un de destabilize those slopes. So we have to be really careful about that. And you as a homeowner could potentially be doing something along the same lines. Uh, we get calls from people who live in earth fissure areas where there are earth fissures and they say, what can I, and they may have a fissure on their property and they say, what can I do to mitigate that? And our answer is keep any, you know, don't let, don't let water get into it because that will erode the fissure walls and allow the further collapse. So if you can keep water out of it, you probably have stabilized it. It's still there, but if water doesn't get in, it's not going to open up any wider. I'm going to push on to a couple, one other thing, um, maybe that. Just for those folks who are interested in the ge local geology, we have our down to earth, our down to earth uh, series, which has 23 free publications you can get to online that tell you about the geology in, in Tucson and the Chiricahuas and the Flagstaff area and elsewhere, San Oak Creek Canyon. So that we have a lot of things like that that are designed for the general public. Most of our stuff, of course, are professional and technical reports that many people would struggle with, but the Down to Earth series is designed for people who are just interested in geology and don't have a background. So leave, let's, oh, I was gonna. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to put that into the chat. So if anybody okay. thought it was R-E-P-O. And if you like, I mean, I can, if you like, I can send you these slides if you, if you want them, that's okay. Okay, got it. Actually, I just said, I just wanted, if people have, a few folks who are listening have any questions, any concerns, my email is down in the left-hand corner, fmconway at arizona.edu. Our website at azgs.arizona.edu has a Center for Natural Hazards in Arizona. You can get to our uh, Natural Hazard in Arizona viewer there and look for your set, look where you're at and look to see what sorts of hazards might be in your area. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time out of your super busy schedule to spend it with us and to let us just barrage you with questions. I know I feel 
like I've learned a lot today as I'm sure others are as well. So thank yeah. you so much for that. We appreciate it. Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. And I just want to reemphasize uh, at the survey, we really see ourselves sort of as a, a service agency. So uh, we respond to questions as quickly as we can. We get a lot of calls from people um, uh, with people who live in areas where there are earth fissures or other such things and call and ask questions. We're happy to answer them. And I'm a little less happy about meteorites. I get a lot of meteorite questions. Uh, chances of you're having a meteorite in your hand when you call and say, I've got a meteorite are, are very low. <laughs> Hazard associated with that, but it's still very low. All right. Well, thank you so much again. So just a quick preview of what we have coming next week for our guest. Um, we actually have Mark Wolfson joining us, who is actually the producer of the reptile and amphibian show that's happening this weekend. So not sure if you guys have ever been to that, um, but you can go check that out this weekend. It's pretty amazing. They have some great um reptiles to look at if that's your thing. I know it's not my favorite thing, but uh, a lot of people enjoy that. But also he's been um, a nature photographer for years and also is pretty knowledgeable about sn uh, snakes. He's been a breeder of over 30 different types of snakes over the years and just has a pretty vast knowledge. So we'll look forward to coming up with some questions for him. But we thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you'll join us again next week. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, Mike, we really appreciate your time being here. Thank you so much. I had a great time. All right. Have a good day, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Oh.